What's up, dude? Sean, chillin', bro. Welcome, man. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Dude, I appreciate it. Yeah, it was convenient that you live so close. Bro, smooth. Oh, yeah. Smooth. That's when I know that there's, like, synergy and things Hell, happening. Yeah. Call me up. Hey, dude. I'm like, bro, I'm Fuck 45, yeah. 50 minutes away. Let's That's do this. perfect. And then it rained like crazy. We were watching it on the news, so I was getting worried that you could uh, get stuck out there. No, nah, bro. Were, you were clear on it. The clouds cleared. Hell, yeah. <laughs> so, welcome, man. Yeah, you have it. an incredible story. Tons of adversity. Mm-hmm. And just wild, dude. Mm. Like, the minute you came on to the internet, everyone's got to know what's going on. Yeah. Because that's a fucking wild story. So let's jump into it. Yep. So this is the Better Broken podcast. We did it. I started it for, because my book just came out recently, my second book, Better Broken. Mm. Um, my past, lots of trauma growing up, um, shit like that. And I truly believe that that trauma shapes us and that we could use it to our advantage. So I like to have people on that have been through some shit. Yeah. Um, especially when it, that shit's not a perfect road. Yeah, that's you not, know? man, if it's a perfect road, it ain't interesting. It's not, it's not interesting, but it's not teaching you anything. Yeah, 100%. And you're not growing from it. You're not able to use that. Mm. Like you see, especially like in, in the qualification course, you see a lot of these officers and they're just fucking silver. Sp- no offense to them, dude. They're, mm. they're using the, the tools that they had available, right? Yep. But clearly we're born with spoons in their mouths. You know, their parents were fucking high ranking officers Mm -hmm. and then they followed that footsteps and then they go to the most prestigious school and their senators are writing them letters. And it's just this like path of, you know, from here to here and Mm -hmm. and they follow it. But to me, the real story comes in from dudes that find their own way, fuck that way up, find a new way, Mm -hmm. doors close and they reopen them on their own. Yep. And from what I've seen, that's your story. Man, I appreciate that. Hell I love yeah. the name too, Better Broken, because, man, you break, you heal back stronger, mm-hmm. right? Better broken, you know? You just keep on going, keep stacking, yeah. keep stacking that calcium. Man. Hell yeah. <laughs> so let's jump into let's jump into the nitty-gritty of it, dude. Okay. So obviously, you look like a fucking Navy SEAL. Oh, appreciate it. <laughs> man. <laughs> man, if you say it, people better believe you, right? <laughs> dude, you walk in, you're fucking shit brick house, dude. Uh, you look like a Navy SEAL. You, I would imagine that you identified heavily as a Navy SEAL, and that oh, was bro. that was a, a a big thing for you. Yeah, so that was well, everything. I, I could imagine, yeah. dude. Being a Green Beret was everything for me. Yeah. Um, I don't quite look the part as much as you do, you know. But yeah, you do, bro. <laughs> no, yeah, you do, bro. I, I definitely. I, I walked in. I was like, oh yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is Sean, dude. Oh yeah. So let's talk about your time getting into the SEALs. What that time was like for yeah. you, and then how it ended mm-hmm. but then maybe like get into what you, what do you think caused yeah that conflict for you internally that mm-hmm. led to your yep. separation from the seals absolutely <sighs> getting into the seal teams i had already stacked a lot of problems right so as an adolescent kind of in high school i was already stacking those bad habits i knew i wanted to be a seal but it was down the road, mm-hmm. right? And so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go to college. That's kind of just what was happening. And, oh, okay. And But I was partying. I was going out. Okay, I get in a big car accident, get ejected out of the this lifted tundra, and I'm broken. <laughs> Literally broke my, dislocated my hip and like uh, had to get it popped in. So my football that year at college was all messed up and drinking, not even going to practice, not going to school, get kicked out immediately and like, Two, three months, right? Back in my mom's house, back at junior college. I'm like, dude, I'm a, I was BMOC. And I, now I'm living at my mom's house, not even going to junior college, dealing drugs, doing drugs, not going to junior college, trying to do construction at not, in the daytime and not missing work. Just absolute, just nightmare, right? And um, had a moment of clarity and I called my dad who had his issues. He is a Marine and got out and, you know, he had his issues with drugs and alcohol and stuff. So I, I could talk to him. And I said, man, I'm, I need to get the fuck out of here. Right. So I, so I did, I gave up everything and all the money I had. And I moved back East to Boston where in the basement of my aunt and uncle's house. Right. And so I'm 19 at this point. Okay, reset, do land, work in landscaping, start going to junior college, kind of getting these credits going. And 
because I just thought that's what you did. That's what I did. I go go to keep going to college and then I'll go in the military after. And I did, right? I go, I transfer, I get back to California, but those bad habits are, I still hadn't rooted out that lack of self-worth or whatever that was, right? Now I'm getting arrested for drunken publics, multiple. Again, I probably arrested seven or eight times in this like year and a half that I was up kind of finishing college. Ended up graduating, barely, but I was on probation. I was on, I had gotten a DUI. I had driving on suspended, like all these stacked things that I was just so immature and lacked self-awareness to realize what mountain I was mounting for myself trying to get in the military. And I go to the recruiter, like, hey, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, just, hey, man, I want to get in the military. The guy's like, dude, you're fucking on probation, man. Huh. Like, <laughs> dude, you have pending court cases. We can't touch you, bro. Like, you have got to clean this up. And I'm like, that's when I'm, I realized that, bro, I was so immature. Oh, shit, I got to figure this shit out. And I did. I got a lawyer, said, hey, what do I do? The judge was like, I'm not going to commute this probation. I was on a three-year informal probation. Which if people don't know, you can't get in the military on even any type of probation. So I go to jail. I get sent to jail. And they, they, I do, I said six months, but I end up getting four. And so I end up doing three. That was with the pending court case that you had? That was just all my court cases were done. Okay. But I had a probationary term of three years. And it was wait three years or figure out a way to get this probation kind of thrown away so I can enter into the military enlist. Oh, so your jail time actually shortened that. Yes, my jail period. time commuted that 3 years into uh, 6 4 months. Which that's that's something that people may not think about, but that's already showing that mindset. Yes. Is here's an obstacle. Yep. 3 years is too long. Yep. How do I get rid of that? Yep. And you found you, you had a door closed in your face, you found an open one. Well, absolutely. Yeah. That's a really really well put, Sean is Man, what is your objective? <laughs> is waiting three years even going to be, there's no way I was going to wait three years. That's a fucking long time, mm. especially when you're you know, 22 years old trying to get in the military. So I just, I talked to multiple attorneys. I talked to everybody. Everybody said it wasn't even possible. I just kept asking until somebody said, okay, that's literally what, and that's what I had to do trying to get in the military also as we go along here. Go to jail, <laughs> not a beautiful place, you know, 23 hour lockdown facility, no yard time, no, and it's county jail. So didn't see the did sun you, for three months. You had three months in jail? Yeah. So I'm 22, 23, only guy there on a misdemeanor. Wasn't felonies, by the way. It was just misdemeanors, but a lot of them. And the judge, rightfully so, he's like, you know, hey, prove it. You really want to go in the military? I'm not just going to stamp this clean. Good on him. I, and so I went in and had some time to think and- Got out, ready. To, okay, I'm good. I'm clear. Now let's start this process. Can I interrupt you for one? Yeah, second? go ahead. All right. Did you learn anything from jail? What What was your What was your jail experience like? I I feel like a lot of people have. I've been very close. Yeah. I should have been in jail multiple mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like? What was that experience like? Uh, and what did you did you take anything away from it, or did you legitimately feel like that was dead time? I took a lot away from that because I saw, I wish I would have taken more, <laughs> yes, like, but I saw, man, methamphetamine, what it does, you know, you're a, you're a police, you've seen out in the streets what that, sh what that does. So I saw what methamphetamine did to people, really what being a fucking loser looks like, right? I didn't, I was like, man, I knew I wasn't that, I was a different caliber. But it got me pretty focused that, dude, I got to get going quick on this because I'm not better than these people. I am these people right now. That was kind of my thought process. But I felt good in there. I was get on. I was I've always been good about kind of getting on a program, figuring out what works and just being OK with where I'm at. So it was a reality check for me. It was I was playing games for all this time. And, dude, I'm in jail now, bro. <laughs> like I got to jumper on and I'm in jail. So it was a reality check that I needed, but I felt good getting that cleaned up. So I was actually not like dreary. I felt good actually in that process, finally being able to move forward mm. and coming out of jail, I was ready, but I was terrified of trying to be a seal. 
seriously, I'm full of fear. I knew that if I failed buds, I'd be on a ship in the fucking Navy. And I was like, bro, I was te- like, that was a real fear for me. I knew I could not do that. And so I was like, I'll go to the Marine Corps. Well, I'll, you know, I was like, they'll give me a gun. I can deploy and that will be what I'll do. And I tried to officer recruiter first. <laughs> Don't know what I was thinking. I was shooting for the stars and they took pictures of my tattoos and were like, bro, you're fucking no way. And not only no way, you can't even enlist in the Marine Corps. I how, said, how tattooed were you? At I just time? had my whole back done a little on my legs, none on my arms and neck. Mind you, they were just like too much of a percentage of your body's tattooed. Wow. You can't even enlist in the Marine Corps. They put a hold on me for nationwide. I couldn't go into any. They were like, no way. Some general saw it and was, had to stick up his ass and said no. Took it on the chin. Went to the Army. I was like, bro, I go Army, SF or something because at least I think that they'll be a little looser on the tattoos, right? Because I knew that, okay, maybe if the SF or Ranger or something didn't work out some special program, at least I'll be infantry, right? I won't be on a boat, right? That's what kind of – I wanted to be a soldier. That was – I knew that's what I knew mm. boots on the ground and they said fucking no the army turned me away for background and they did a preliminary background check and said no way you're toast we won't touch you that was scary so I, that was that was the moment where I hit some real depression for about two three days that's when I started researching about the French Foreign Legion that's when that came on my radar I was like okay the if I need to do some shit and I need to get make some shit happen, this is my look red, grab red. This is what I can make. This is what I can make happen. But I had loans and debt and stuff from college. I, my, you know, my parents didn't pay for my, my mom's a single mom, you know, so I was paying for all that shit out of like debt. So I couldn't just leave. She had co-signed on stuff. I was like, okay, I'm going to just try this Navy thing. It'll be my like Hail Mary pass. And the dude looked at my chart. He said, we can work with this, man. And it was a moment where the universe opened up. Mm. I was like, Whew. just to grab that that shred of, I hate the word hope, but just that shred of hope. And from that point on, it was stressful, but going through maps, going through all that stuff. And that was kind of my process where then I, you know, tra- starting to train for getting that SEAL contract. So I have a question based on all that is, do you think you were born with that desire and ability to to never see a closed door or never accept a closed door? Or do you think that's something that you developed through hardship? Where do you think that came from? This is that's an interesting question because there's it you got to be and you understand this SF guys understand this. You have to be quasi delusional. Mm-hmm. Delusional confidence. And I don't mean it in like this weird bad way. You have to they're like oh dude that's it's not possible it's 0.001 you go okay so it's possible right it's like yeah so no you can't absolutely you can't is there a yeah there's a shred okay well that's me hold on to that shred yeah uh, that's me and I don't know where that develops from I think that part of it's bred in I think that there's part of it that is just in us you know our our community kind of guys that think that way I think it would. I think it would be an injustice to everyone that would listen to this podcast, or everyone that listens to any motivational podcast, is to argue that it's some of it doesn't have to do with your DNA. Yeah. Like obviously, a lot of it is mm-hmm. from trauma, from mindset, from yeah. all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But to say that none of it stems from DNA would yeah. be. It would be. That would be a travesty for certain people that just don't have that in. Yeah. Them. That it's a. It's a absolute tenacity Mm -hmm. there's that it's like those pit bulls those game bred pit bulls that are just they're gonna go if they have a broken like just all the time it's bred in you and i think you can hone it Mm -hmm. right there's guys that you know we know and who fall off and just just because they get lackadaisical who might have it and it just kind of fades away that's possible and you can absolutely but that seed is planted somewhere and i think people can develop it through with through better skills and getting more confident they can develop it but there's a seed of truth of just absolute tenacity bred in for Mm -hmm. sure i agree so then so you finally get the opportunity the navy seal guy says we can work with this yeah and then how does your selection are you just smooth sailing through that whole 
pipeline? No. So, so that was, I had to do delayed entrance processing because, so I signed on with like a different job because I couldn't do any other job because of the drug charge. They were like, bro, you can be, you could wrangle shit or be a Navy SEAL. There was no, there was no in between of jobs for me. They're like, you got to earn your SEAL contract or you're going to ship on this fucking turd wrangler contract <laughs> that I signed. So I was like, well, I can't run. My running is just absolutely not my strong suit. I've been training. Were you big then too? Yeah, I was bigger. I was probably heavier. I was like, I needed to lose some weight. Like, I was walking out of jail probably like two thirty, bro. Damn. Yeah, two thirty. And Did you I, scrap it all in jail? No, not too bad. No, got, no, gotten some little, like, got some little, little issues, but really not too bad. Okay. Yeah, it, it was actually pretty smooth sailing for me in there. And but I couldn't run, man, because I trained for football and shit my whole life. I wasn't running and lacrosse a little bit, but. Definitely not long distance. So I started running and stuff, and I realized, bro, I couldn't run a fucking mile without stopping. Dead serious. Mm. I was. That's like, a lot of meat to carry around, dude. Bro, I was. I was hurting, bro. <laughs> I ran around the block and, and ran around the corner, and I stopped. I went, oh no, yeah. I got to get. I got to get in touch with somebody. Yeah. So I talked to the recruiter. I said, like, what's the landscape here for training? I said, there's a SEAL motivator, for a retired, you know, lieutenant commander. He's got this. Oh, there's region, SEAL motivator region, and then there's some active duty, you know, senior chiefs and stuff that will actually kind of like also proctor all the tests. You got to get FaceTime with these guys because they're the ones that need to sign your contract and will give you your contract. And I was like, that's where I'm at. So I was stacking boxes at fucking Home Depot at night, training in the day as much as I could, like just saving for gas money to drive down to Coronado, train. And I, dude, I was puking every day you know, half mile sprints. I mean, it was the hardest I'd ever worked in my life. Mm. I was like, whoa, the first workout I did, I was like, whoa, this is next level of, of, okay, this is what I need to do though. All right. If this is flutter case and just, you know, two, three hour workouts and lo and behold, I was getting better. I was getting leaner, lost 40 pounds in like six weeks, Damn. dead serious. And still barely making the times, but now I failed my first PSD. But then I just like, they're like, I'm like, when are they? He said, they're every week. I said, oh, okay, I'm taking them every week then. And I was like the only cat. Took them every week for nine months, man. And then finally, there you go. One day they called me and said, hey, man, you got a SEAL contract. And I shipped out on that. And I and I signed that like August 26, 2009. Then shipped out in February to boot camp and then started that whole process. You made it through everything first time? Yeah, I did. Hell yeah. Yeah, I made it through everything first time. Not on phase though, you know, I had yeah. I had a couple boards you know, in, in buds where I, I failed the O course, you know, like O course and running were always my, <laughs> I had to, I was nervous starting those yeah. things because it weren't a gimme. I had to put out. Right. And uh, the swimming was fine though. I was always pretty good at the swimming. And Which is wild for someone your size too. Yeah. I, well, but, I swam a little bit growing up. Okay. Yeah. You know, I swam a little bit, but dude, gravity, bro. Yeah. <laughs> dude, gravity, bro. I'm floating, man. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, one of the things that you mentioned that people don't realize too, it's a, a part of a success mindset is when you when you f aren't good at something yeah you seek out a professional yeah you're like i i need help yep and that's something that people don't get they all oh, do it myself i'll do it myself and it's like no like guys like us if you're if you're failing if you're deficient at something you find someone that's going to help you do it and i had the same thing i was trying to go back into the military to uh air force mm -hmm. the special operations uh officer program they mm -hmm. had and I, when I tried the swimming thing, I was sinking like a rock. So I went to professional that trained Olympic swimmers. Yep. And they put me in the pool with all the cameras and recorded me. And he was like, dude, <laughs> you got a lead in your ass. Yeah. He's like, every time you swim, your ass sinks down like this. And he's like, you can't even keep your feet up straight. So I just, water's hard. It's, uh, it's, it was not my thing. It's the great equalizer. Yeah. But to hit on the coaching piece, and that's, we'll talk about this later, but why I ended up kind of transitioning into that is, bro. The best people in the world at anything have a coach. Mm -hmm. The best swimmer in the world has a fucking coach. And people will be like, well, I don't need a life coach or I don't need a fitness coach. I'm like, and they're not even <laughs> close to the best or you're the best at life or you, man, get that outside perspective. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs an outside perspective or I should say can benefit. Elite business guys have mentors, mm -hmm. right? The min surgeons who have been practicing for years still go to courses Always to learn, learning. right? Learning. It's a constant process that if the minute you start to be like, man, because it's ego, 
Mm. That's the only thing that would hold you up from, man, I'm a Green Beret, man, I've done this, man, I don't need some coach to tell me how to, I'll figure it out, right? And there's that piece. That's why guys like us are hard to talk to sometimes because they've done a lot, right? I understand where that confidence comes from, but it's being realistic that, man, can I benefit? Will I be better if I get an outside perspective on this? 99% of the answer is yes. Yes, absolutely. Yep. So you get into the SEAL teams. What is your SEAL experience like? Man, I was so happy when I got there. It was like... Dude, you had to fight to get there. It That's was, the difference, man. Like it, so, ugh, there's yeah. kids walking in saying, I want to be a SEAL, and the guy's saying, here you go. Yeah, and, it, and I, we saw those guys in boot camp, yeah. and they went out the, out the front back door fast. And by the time I was there, I was so... People say, oh, if you didn't think about quitting, you're lying. Bullshit! I never thought about quitting. Bro, my mom's house was right down the street. I could have left any time, bro. I was... I was, I thought it sucked. I didn't know if I could do it or right. keep going for sure. But I never thought about quitting, bro, because I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere to go. I had painted myself into the corner. That was, that was really how my reality, at least that I, the story I told myself. Right. And, and I'm sure you can, you know, identify with that, you know, coming mm -hmm. from where your background, man, you don't have anywhere to go. There's nowhere to run hide to, bro. This is the best. This is the best opportunity. To this is the best. And yeah. I was happy where I was yeah. at. It was, and, and so I, you know, worked through it, worked through it, struggled, got into the teams, SEAL Team 7 is where I went, which is where I wanted to go. I felt like it was on this divine wave. I really did because I was at the team I wanted to be at from way back. And you know what? I hit a good clip. I had good leadership. I was like volunteered for some things early that set me up really well. I was at comms. Then I get JTAC. Then I get sniper nice. as a new guy. Nice. And I was like, I cannot, I cannot, but I was, could not think about anything but work, right? You get there at that and you're feeling that I just wanted to be at the team. I wanted to be in the high bay. I wanted to be cleaning my cage and organizing my gear, going on trips. I volunteer. I just, I was immersed in it completely. And so I was, I felt fortunate and I felt really happy, man. And that, right, is where that celebratory mood kind of ni fucking nipped me in the ass, right? I started getting into this celebratory mood where it's dangerous for guys like us and guys listening can identify this, man. You, When you're peaking, that's when you need to really hone it, hone it back. Mm -hmm. Slow down, take that hit. Take that knee, hit that sills, because I was flying. I was, you know, working hard and partying harder and still re still responsible, always with work first. But I was just so fucking happy that when I was out, it was like, you know, let's, let's get let's, yeah, get, let's it. get it. I was in that celebratory yeah. mood. And man, if you drink like that, you know, and that immature, man, bad shit happens. And mm -hmm. it was just a matter of time before it ended up happening right so what happened yeah so so i hit a little bit of a rocky point oh i get arrested in uh you know at kind of in the first couple of years just picked up and well, i got arrested in sqt and that got swept under the rug by the cop very cool just drunk in public nothing crazy i was just walking home drunk right i was like oh almost lost everything okay and then you know good for a little bit and then okay go out again a year or two later get clipped up again same thing kind of like drunk walking home so kind of swept under the rug again really under the radar told my leadership they're like yeah, it wasn't really anything you know and go to I go to yemen deploy to yemen come back arrested again in front of a bar swept under the rug again by the cop right just drunk and pumped no paperwork so you weren't you weren't fighting you not were fighting just, just being a fucking just being asshole a, just being loud be, you know just like just not locked on, lost yeah. wits, lost. Who the fuck knows? You know, blacked out, just not being, not fighting, doing bad shit. Are you with your team boys at the uh, during these times? Or yeah, just by yeah, yourself? yeah, yeah. We're out, you know, we're out, kind of doing the thing, and then you know, you walk outside. But that's why I always say, man, no, no, no great virtue is going to be found in front of a bar at four in the morning. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's only I've, problems. I've, I've picked up steel bar stools with my teammates and thrown them at people. I've been. I've had the cops called on me. I've hidden bushes waiting for guys that I didn't <laughs> like to come out so I could yeah. attack them. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, you, you can't take all that aggression, all that training. It, you, I'm not saying you can't, but it's rare to take all that, put it in, put alcohol in it, yeah. put us together. And pe what people don't realize is that 
when we, especially as newer guys on the team, yep. when we're with our teammates, we haven't been to war yet with them. Mm-hmm. Fight is war. Yep. Uh, a confrontation is war. Mm-hmm. It's a chance for us to prove to them that we have their backs and to that we're willing to do the fucking deed. Yep. So it, it's some people may look at that and be like, I can't believe you're going out and having these instances, but we've a lot of us have these instances, just not always getting caught yeah. for it. Yeah. So to think that that's not prevalent in the special operations community, mm-hmm. you'd be lying to yourself and you'd be painting a a picture of the SF community. Right. That's, just not realistic. Right. And always better to be professional, right? Mm. I was immature. That was the truth. And there's a, you know, there, that I was like, I take it on the chin on myself, just that lack of, imma- lack of maturity. So now flowing in and I'm still on a good clip, right? Still kind of the golden boy doing the right stuff and, and nothing had really come on the radar hitting schools, getting good looks, getting good, you know, uh, evaluations, living in a high rise with my boys downtown, really enjoying life, hitting training trips, hitting training trips and the momentum's picking up again, getting a little ahead of my skis again, Mm. getting a little ahead of my skis. And I go on a training trip, hit a guy in a bar. Now this was, this was a real one, right? I'm on a JTAC trip. I hit a guy in a bar. He gets hurt. GBH. Great bodily harm, right? So I get charged with aggravated assault. So I get charged with a felony. So now it's oh, real. Shit. So now it's real, right? And so just from the hit, just one or hit. Did he land and hit. No, or? one hit just broke his orbital eye socket. It was enough of an injury to yeah. be a GBH. Yeah. Right? And so that's what I tell you. Hey, man, dude, it only takes one, right? Mm-hmm. There's there's guys in prison who hit a guy one time, fell down and died. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of those. Yeah. So be I, careful. High school party. My brother walks out and I was like, where are you going? And he's like, don't worry about it. I'll be right back. They go outside. Uh, his buddy just got out of the Marine Corps. Fist full of quarters. <sighs> lays the dude out. The guy falls. Hits his, ruptures his spleen on a um, flower pot yeah. on the bricks. And then gets rushed to the hospital and like nearly dies. I think he actually did die. They brought him back. Almost died again. Changed his entire fucking life. He yeah. lived, but he's... He's got permanent damage yep. for the rest of his life because mm-hmm. of that one hit. So, yeah, that shit happens. And it's terrifying. Yeah. So it's set yourself up for success, right? When that happens, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was definitely responsible because I could have left. I could have been less intoxicated. I could have been, I was on a date with a girl in like a restaurant. So it was actually kind of a casual environment, but just stayed at the bar, stayed at the bar. Dude's acting, you know, and then it just, escalated boom one hit but i could have left i could have recognized the signs i could have been less intoxicated that was all the reality of the situation and so i had to come to terms with that later which i didn't at that time i didn't i didn't have that level of ownership yet but now my world has changed now i'm facing a felon now i have a, a top secret security clearance now i have a felony charge now i'm getting out of jail you know my i have a team guy homie who bailing me out now I'm fighting this case. Now I have lawyers on retainer. Now I'm hemorrhaging cash. Now I'm dealing with all that stuff. Now I'm pulled out of the platoon, not training. We get some things work, get some things. Now I'm back into training after a couple months. So, okay, things are working. Things are working. They give me approval to go to Iraq, even on bail, to go Iraq with this pending court case because it was just getting delayed. Mm. So they go, okay, you're good. Fantastic. I was so happy to get back. I was so happy to be on that deployment because I just wanted to put it, put it away. Mm -hmm. But now I'm dealing with the stress of the only plea deal I had was six years plus three, six years in prison plus three for that. That case was my only plea deal that they would, would not budge on. Oh shit. Yeah, man. So it was serious with, and I said, Based on, that's a shitty plea for anybody watching. Yep. I mean, I've seen people do far worse and get pled down to probation. Yeah. Especially as a cop, you yeah. you know that almost almost everybody you put away mm-hmm. is playing down to jack shit. Yep. And it doesn't matter how serious it is. Mm-hmm. So is it because of your past that they hit you with such a shitty part plea? of it? Part of it was a little bit of a they thought I should have known better, shouldn't have been this aggressive, shouldn't have, you know, da-da-da, and they were kind of throwing the book at me. But it was just the 
the plea deal they gave me. They knew it was going to. You think the being a SEAL had something to do with that too? Yeah, I think yeah. it probably didn't. It didn't help me for this because it was, it was. It's movie shit. It was a local guy yeah. and I'm some guy in town training, right? Yeah. And they didn't want that stuff happening. Not, okay, good on them. But that was what I was sitting with on a roof in Iraq. Yeah. <laughs> thinking about going back here. I was trying to volunteer to stay out there. I want, I thought about joining the Kurdish Peshmerga. I thought of everything, bro. Mm. I was like stressing. Yeah. That was a dark deployment for me. But I was having to come to terms with this was started to be that process where I'm like, bro, I don't know if I'm living right. If this is my reality, right? I'm ruining my dream right now by one night out here, just one night by just not being in control, just not being, not taking care of the things that I worked so hard for and just pretty much going to throw it away. Right. And so I had to come back and deal with that. You know, I, so I came back, we got it cleaned up. Now I'm, but now I'm on formal probation, four years. They gave me a misdemeanor. They get it pled down the, on the courthouse steps that day, right? Damn. Yeah, I'm, I'm hung over, like, in my dress blues, like, just come from the strip club. Like, I thought I was walking the plank. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I'm like, fuck it, dude. Like, I'm, so I'm sitting there, like, I guess I get a call from my attorney. He's like, we got a deal for you, four years formal, paper handcuffs. You can't leave San Diego without a pro like, it was, I couldn't own a weapon. It was all this shit. And I said, I don't care. As long as it's a misdemeanor. So that's, let's that's do it. what got you kicked out too. Like that decision that you couldn't own a weapon, obviously. No, be, no, 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 <laughs> no, man. I'll even, I'm going to, I'm going to take this even further. That gets cleared up. And they were like, well, at work. Okay. But you can't own one in private <laughs> Dude, they, type thing. Right. And they're so, drawing a circle. And around so it. I was like, and I get my TS, I got my top secret security clearance back after I get this stuff cleared up. Bro, I'm I'm back in it. I'm back in it. But I wasn't supposed to be able to drink. Wasn't supposed to be able to leave San Diego without approval. There was like all these things I was supposed to do. And I was good for a month. <laughs> and then For a month. For a month. And then I kind of got loose and then started dating some girls. And then, you know, it's kind of starts picking back up. And I go to a concert, man. And I'm, I'm like, oh, I'll drink a little bit. And with this girl and I get in a golf cart, dead serious. Get in trouble with, by this fucking golf cart, dude. Cops roll up on me. I go, well, I got to get the fuck out of here, right? I can't have these guys run my play. I'm like, you're on probation. Yeah, I'm so. on probation. This is not going to be good. I tried to get away. They stick the dog on me, tase me, turns into this whole thing where it just cascaded off of one small dumb decision that I made. Uh, well, it started with the drinking. Then it started with the small, you know, right? It just... Your decisions, still they matter, all those little ones. And next thing you know, I'm arrested again on an aggravated assault charge on a police officer oh, from a, yeah, from from a getting in a golf cart and trying to run and that. You know? So the you, you get in the, you're drinking, you get in the golf cart. Why do they pull you over? Because you're in the golf cart on a public road? Yeah, no, I was in the parking lot, but it was the county golf cart, right? Okay. It's a county concert golf cart. So you left the No, I was just kinda like going around the parking lot, right? And just fucking joy being an asshole okay being a fucking asshole and and just like eh, cruising in a golf cart and fucking that's how dumb i ruined my seal career that decision just cruising in a golf cart that cruising in a golf cart drunk like a fucking asshole and uh on probation what do you know cops come get it all pled down you know it, it gets the case gets tossed out because it was nothing right it was just the original charge but it brought all the heat on me now Navy Jag is up my ass. They're like, this guy just beat that case, we, comes back. Now he's beat this other case. So I wasn't even going to get kicked out for any of this stuff. I had beat it. They go, we drug test him. I passed. I was uh, Drugs weren't my thing. That wasn't like what I was doing. They go, we want this guy nailed to the cross. They uh, steroid tested me. Fucking lit that test up, <laughs> motherfucker, dude. <laughs> I lit that motherfucker. And they sent it off to the, the Olympic Center in UCLA, paid like fucking four it's grand. Yeah. They paid like four grand for this formal test for me only to have this test. And man, I hit every fucking thing. And I said, okay, and they were like, no tolerance, zero tolerance. It's looked at like drugs. You're out, right? So, so of all that, you get popped on steroids. That was it. That was what that was what kicked me out. 
But the catalyst was, right, being an asshole, making dumb decisions, right. bringing all the heat on me and doing... None of that would have happened if I would have been acting correct. Right. But and, you, you got it. You jumped... Uh, you must have felt like a fucking professional at dodging charges. Dude, man, I was so... I don't know how I was managing the stress. I can't. I was looking back. I was I was hurting, dude, for the, from the stress for years. Finally, when I got that cleared up later, I realized I was like, bro, I was walking with a gorilla on my back of stress after I had gotten because then I cleared all that up. I get off probation. I served more time in Idaho, so I went to jail twice as an active duty Navy SEAL in Idaho, and. During that time, right? So I come back from the assault on the police officer. You no, went to jail. so I had served. I had to serve a little time off that plea deal, first. Okay. So I went to. I took vacation and went to jail for for like two three weeks, active duty. Then I came back, was back in the training pipeline doing, <laughs> and was ready to rock and roll when I get in trouble again. But now I'm kind of getting pushed out, but I'm still active duty. But I'm like, they know I'm on my way out, and so I had to, I had to go back to get the commu- all the probation all squared away, served more time in Idaho where I where the violation was, the original case. And so two times in jail in Idaho and the cop, the COs there were like, this fucking seal, bro. They're like, this fucking guy is back, right? Holy shit. Yeah, man. so it was stressful, man. And then I get out and I'm out, right? I walk out of jail that second time. I sign my DD-214 the next day. I got a general discharge under honorable circumstances because the commanding officer of SEAL Team 7 hit me with a bro move because I would have had an OTH. He had the power to up at one. He's like, this guy's actually, you know, had a good reputation. He worked hard for us. Just mm-hmm. a dumbass on sometimes off the field. Let's give him a general. That was a fucking unbelievable move. So I'm really grateful for him for that. And now I'm a civilian. I walk out and then, then I'm... So I started, moved into a civilian job doing like supervising construction and stuff pretty much two days later. And then how, how long were you civilian before you decided to go over? And right when I started my civilian work is when all the bad habits really started, right? That's, I mean, I started almost day one. I was like, well, no, governor's off. Adderall, Xanax, weed, drinking every fucking Everything. day, every day, all the time. Not a, not a mess. I mean, I was working. I was working hard. I was still going to the gym. But I was like, okay, well, maybe I don't really have any reason to not sip on some vodka at the gym. You know, it finished with work, right? Might as well just kind of a little buzz on before I go home. So that's where it's kind of like going. That's mm-hmm. where it was. I didn't drink in the morning and stuff. It wasn't like that. That's how I could lie to myself. Yeah. Right? That's, that's how I, I'm like, well, I'm fucking disciplined with my shit, right? I wait till after work and I go in the gym and I'm still kind of like looking good and feeling good. And yeah. I have a beautiful girlfriend by the beach, but I would, you can't maintain that, right? right? You can't bend reality like that. And a year into that, I stack on a fentanyl and opioid problem. Hmm. So I'm doing that every night also. Now you have fentanyl every fucking night, Holy every night shit. sniffing it. Right. And Going face down, bro, messing my face up sometimes, like pretty much probably died like two, three times and just like shake it off, like get up the next day, dead serious. Like looking back, bro, just lost, no purpose, lost soul, right? And I think a lot of guys, why my message resonates? Because I'm so just fuck. The only way to fucking get any type of progress is to get honest right Mm -hmm. we can't i can't expect people to be authentic with me if i can't be authentic myself it'd just be like hey man this was me dude i was found face down by my girlfriend bleeding she's screaming right that was that was reality that was fucking me dude you know and i thought it was fine i could still wake up from that brush myself off and be like i'm good (laughs) good (laughs) fucking (laughs) stitches across my face right like i'm not good and you know what that's when i lost everything that's when I was crushing it. And now I'm my boss at the time. I had moved into like working for a venture capitalist. And I was pitching decks and raising money and doing lots of stuff so I could keep lying to myself. I was going a million miles an hour and until I crashed and burned, fell on my face. And he goes, dude, you were an asset, now you're a liability. And that was like, right? I get the chills thinking about it because that was 
us, the type of guys we are, bro, that's like the worst thing you could say to somebody, right? It gives me the like chills thinking about it. Is that you're not you're a liability and not like a benefiting member of the tribe, right? And you're you're not even useful anymore. Mm. You're a detriment. That was like fuck because I need that identity and that purpose and mm-hmm. that want to be. I want to be useful, man. Right. <laughs> you know, I want to be need, useful. We need to be useful. Have to be. We it's have in to. our DNA. Right. So that was. Now I have my. Per- I don't have a job. I don't have fucking anything, man. And so I moved out to Hawaii to kind of like reset. And he, I was kind of like put out there to hey, we got some stuff coming, but you know, I just get cut off, chopped away. Com- communication wise then i go oh fuck man it was a couple months you know until i just kind of like ran out of money really and i'm like in my truck no gas park enough gas to like park somewhere where i knew i wouldn't have to drive right in the jungle on the big island of hawaii where nobody would fuck with me kind of like where the volcanoes flowing like dead serious like right there and i was sitting there and i bro and i had that moment where i turned the truck off and I parked and it was just dead quiet. And I sat there in dead silence for like 12 hours. And I went, holy fuck. I was this. I hadn't even processed losing being losing my trident and all that stuff. I had the beautiful girlfriend, the beautiful job. I had some money and now I have nothing and I'm in my fucking truck and I don't even have gas or any or anything to go anywhere and no purpose to go anywhere. Whoa. Whoa. That was terrifying. I had never been in that situation. And I sat there for like three days, man. I had a sawed off shotgun. I was thinking about killing myself. Dead serious. Mm-hmm. Like not, not emotional, not sad, not crying. That was what the, was the scary part. Right. I was, I was thinking about how to do it logistically without causing a fucking mess, you know, with my family and just like how to make this as smooth as possible. And... I finally had on like the third day, I mean, I'm just like sipping some like vodka that's warm and, you know, trying just sitting in this hot car and fucking shit starts smell, you know, just imagine that scene. And I finally had that moment of clarity where it was called God or consciousness, whatever it was. Okay. And was just like, you are being a little bitch, man. <laughs> Listen to yourself. Listen, I, me, me, I feel in my, I, I, that's, that was what was just blaring is I'm like, bro, I'm being such a pussy right now. I'm sitting in here. I have a mom and sister. Like, what's their life going to look like? If I, I was like, bro, I'm still healthy. I'm still good. Fuck this. I'm going to the French foreign legion. Oh, yeah. Let's do this. If I'm going to die, I'll do it with my boots on. At least maybe they'll let me deploy. Like, this is just not how it's going to go down. Let's. And it's, I'm like, bro, what's that next weird, crazy story? Let's write a fucking interesting story. Mm. N- Navy SEAL goes in the French Foreign Legion. I'm like, I haven't heard that shit. Let's fucking do that. And I took some fast cash loans, organized my affairs, like gave my truck to somebody, said, I'll be back in three years maybe or <laughs> when I can get a hold of you. And I took a, bought a one-way ticket to uh, France, man. How do you even go about linking up with them like you <laughs> yeah, just fucking dude, yeah. <laughs> like there's a lot of logistics here yeah that i would be like even after i made that decision i'm like france where where <laughs> yeah, in france yeah. like is there's not some guy at in france going foreign legion follow yeah. me yeah. you know like fuck but i think before we get to the the french foreign legion because obviously that's a, a crazy part of the story mm-hmm. i think that that moment that you had in your truck is really valuable. Yeah. I think those three days are really important. I think people don't understand that. Mm-hmm. I think you, because like you said, you didn't process losing your trident. You didn't process what you had gained and then lost and then what you had to be grateful for and yep. then lost. It's like all this thing that you're just putting in your rear view and you're doing the SF thing where you're just fucking running past yeah. it to get on to the next thing. Well to, said. You know, but I think people need to understand that a time of self pity is valuable yeah you, like there's moments when you just need to say fuck i'm sad yeah i i feel so sorry for myself yeah you know and then fucking let it wash over you yep cry a little bit mm-hmm. maybe think about fucking ending it um when my wife i walked in on my wife fucking some dude yeah 
And I hit the bottle for a few days and I thought about for the first time, I, I didn't want to be me. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know, necessarily know that I wanted to kill myself. I don't mm -hmm. know how that feeling, the emotions, I don't even know how to describe them. I wish that I could transplant into another human yeah. and start living their life instead. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's like a, a working towards yeah. ending my life. Yep. Um, but it washed over me. And it, it gave me a renewed sense of purpose to just feel sorry for myself yeah. for a little while. And to cry and to say, F fuck, I, I suck. I, I hate it. I hate everything. I'm a fucking loser. Yeah. Um, and that self-pity. But then once you can get it out, you know, then you can fucking shake it off and start to rebuild. Yeah. And say, okay, I did that. Mm -hmm. That's only gotten me so far. Mm -hmm. Now I don't like it here. Now let's get off from this bottom. Because yes. the only other way to go is it's got to be progressing from this because th you know you're at the bottom. Yep. Like you feel it and you mm -hmm. feel the fucking ground for the first time. And that's, I think that's an important thing to do. So I think that three days in your truck is super fucking valuable. That's a good point, Sean, that I hadn't really thought about is the importance of, of that self-reflection, honest mm. self-reflection. And... I hadn't changed my habits yet. That's something that I hadn't figured out the importance of, or I hadn't, I hadn't grasped all these lessons yet and packaged them mm. into some clean thing that I could start doing to even know I had to, what I needed to change to stop this shit from happening. Right. Because I, I knew I would, do bad shit or dumb shit and then I would ruin my life, right? It had, I've done it way back when in high school, right? Get kicked out, then I lose scholarships. Get kicked out of this and I do that. And that, it's just this revolving self-sabotage and I would feel this pity, right? And then I would change and I would get, and I would get better for a while and then I would do something else, right? And then I would do something else and I'd feel this like shame, regret, shame, regret, shame, regret thing again and again, and even sometimes every weekend, right, on micro, micro shit. Mm -hmm. And then there would be this macro thing that would happen, which would cause me, and it was this hard reset, and I wasn't taking time to really, you're right, really being like, man, wh what is causing me this? And I actually let it feel because I was just like, okay, running past it, like mm -hmm. you said. That's a really well, good way to put it, is just, I just, okay, shake it off, I'm good and just keep keep powering through. And this was that time where I really got honest about at least where I was at. I couldn't deny it. <laughs> you know, I was right. like, you know, I couldn't deny it and and I was embarrassed. That was also I think that part of it is I I think we all got to be honest about, man. I care about what people think of me, dude. Mm -hmm. I do, right? That was that was part of the thing that got me through buds, man. I, I, I was terrified of somebody thinking I was a pussy and would quit, right? I, for sure. So I was like embarrassed, man. I always wanted to be this person seen as, you know, successful and capable. And I was just not that, right? I, And I got, that's when I got honest about how I felt about it. And then, right? And then we build a plan, right? What's it? You're, you're lost in the woods. You don't, you can't save yourself if you don't know where you're at. That was, you, you can't take a bearing and a back asthma. You can't, you, you don't know where you're at. You, you don't know where to go. Figure out where you're at. Get honest with yourself. And sometimes that's self-pity. Yeah. Sean, absolutely. Well, well said. Get, well, just feel like, it. Just like you said, you can't, you can't know where to go if you don't know where you're at. But at least rock bottom is some kind of backstop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, yeah. now at least I know somewhere of what, mm -hmm. where I'm at. And it's, I went down. Yeah. And now I'm at the bottom. So, Okay. Now yeah. I have some way that directionally I can go away from. Right. With something if I to push go, off of. I could push off of this and mm -hmm. then get in some positive direction. Yeah. So, yeah, it feels sometimes like rock bottom is at least a checkpoint. Yeah. It's and the shittiest, worst checkpoint, but it's better than fucking nothing. Yeah, it is. And, and it's when we learn those times of compression, right? That evolution happens. Growth doesn't happen in comfort. And, man, I couldn't have thought of a, like a more uncomfortable place is that and i needed to do a really drastic course correction but i didn't know what it was going to look like or how what i needed to do exactly i hadn't mature i knew i was still in it that was also the part mm. i knew i my my i always felt like i had decent character 
and it wasn't off doing you know evil shit and doing like and that was also part of the reason I lied to myself. I'm like, I'm not a bad guy. I just do some dumb shit. Well, I kind of was a bad guy. I was doing dumb, you know, selfish shit, right? That was affecting my family and affecting other people in my life and myself, you know, my my own self worth. And I just knew I needed a major change. I needed some fucking time to think. I needed to strip away all the shit I where I was at, my identity, literally, right? That was also an interesting piece of the Foreign Legion, and so. I had done a little research. I had read threads. That's the only way you could really find mm. some information is small threads. Hey, you go to this base and just knock on the fucking door. And that was, I said, okay, man. Legitimately, that's it. You go to this that's location the only way and you knock can do on it. the fucking door. Yeah, it's the only way you can do it with your passport and a bag. Wow. Yeah, that's it. There's nobody to call. There's no application, nothing. That's terrifying. Dude. Yeah, so it was, it was take a train. I had, you know, I get into a hostel I had some drugs in my system still, Adderall, nothing crazy, but weed and stuff like that. I knew they were going to drug test me. So I just stayed in Paris for like a week, flushing my system, kind of going on runs, trying to get my body back. I mean, I was pretty haggard, you know, I still go in the gym and stuff. If people saw me, they'd be like, oh, that dude's kind of like in shape. But I, I knew I was trash, right? We know, we, we know our own bodies and I knew I could be better. And I just knew I needed to get in there. I needed it to ch- to change. Right? So you essentially detox in a Paris hostel. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, so I, now I was, man. And I was sharing a room with some Australian who had played pro rugby who was just there on vacation, right? Just, just, just in it, in it, man, 34, right? 34. So not some spring chicken, mm. right? <laughs> too old to be going to enlist in the military, right? And coming from SEAL, dude, I knew it was going to be walking into basic infantry. Mm-hmm. I knew it was going to be going into basic infantry boot camp. So I was like, this is going to suck. Yeah. This is going to suck. And did it? Yeah, it did. <laughs> Way worse. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, bro. It's bad? Yeah, it was brutal because, I mean, you get in there and, man, you're shark shit on the bottom of the ocean. You're not even, you're not even enlisted boot camp you're a foreigner in a foreign military right you are you have no legal status you don't even have your own fucking name they take your passport you don't see that thing again for i didn't see that my passport for three years after i gave it to him yeah okay that's fucking terrifying yeah not only is that terrifying especially coming from a ts yeah special operations background we know more than anybody yeah just how precarious that situation is yeah, so I knew I knew I was hanging it out there. Yeah, holy shit. Yeah, so I was, you know, and I wasn't. Vol- I brought my DD two fourteen, so at least they knew who I was coming to the gate, right? Because they're gonna find out some stuff anyway, right? Because they do their due diligence on their background checks. Do they? Yeah, they do their due diligence because they're they don't want guys coming in there with poor, is, issues from Interpol. They mm-hmm. don't want international arms trafficking issues, drug trafficking. They don't want sex crimes, sh- any shit like that. So they actually run their numbers hard. Okay. So Which makes sense because- One out of 15 guys get selected that come to the gate. That's like the numbers okay. kind of on the actual selection. And most of that's not physical. It's all interviews and background. Okay. And a little bit of physical, right? That Just for that beginning part. First thing you do is tell you to get up on, they take your passport, tell you to shut the fuck up and get on the pull-up bar. First thing you do when you walk through the gate. I went in on a Sunday night. It was raining. And, man, I just sent my last text to my mom. I told nobody I was going in. Mm. I was just like, this is happening. I'm not going to tell a fucking soul except, like, my mom. So she didn't think I died, right? Mm Because you're going to get cut off from comms for five months, right, if you make it. If you're lucky, you're cut off for total comms for five months. And then I just started that improcing, man. A lot of guys from Eastern Bloc. A lot of guys from Mongolia, Thailand, dude. And 150 co- na- nations are represented in the French Foreign Legion. So you got 150 languages being spoken. That's what I was going to say. How are you communicating? They speak in English to you? Or? Man, the, uh, at the beginning, they start speaking in English, but then French is required. So you have to learn French. Everything's in French. All military orders are in French. Everything's in French. So they start that pretty quick. But Are you doing courses on, like in the Q course, my, my language was France, yeah. French. and. I lost it completely. It's so hard. French is hard. It's hard. Yeah. It's, it's if, especially when you don't use it. Yeah. So are they giving you classes to teach you French or are they expecting it's, you to pick it up from immersion? No, they have books and stuff. And so during boot camp and things like that, they'll have like an hour of French, right? It's not that great and mostly trial by fire. Mm-hmm. You're shocked how much you can learn 
by pain. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like if you don't learn, you're going to learn, you know, you're going to learn at least the basics quick. And our, our accents are terrible. You know, mm. Americans, we butcher the French. Yeah, it's terrible. We butcher the, so that's part of it. They're like, oh, American, like. Because we, tr- we try, is in the same thing in the course. Like we try to French it up. Yeah. And instead of just saying the words and just accepting that we have weird yeah. accents, we try to make their sounds. And it's just it's, fucking it cringe, doesn't, dude. It doesn't have, it, it is yeah, cringe. And yeah. it's, they actually prefer it if you just own it. <laughs> own yeah. that American accent. That's good to know. Yeah. And that was, that was the beginning process. And that was about a month. You know, and then I had these, they call them Gustapo interviews, which are the hardcore interviews. And most of the guys have a few hour interview where they really hammer into your family or phone. They go through everything, background, and they re- smart guys who speak a lot of languages, who are a lot of experience in the Foreign Legion. And mine was four days, eight hours a day with like high ranking guys. They're like, why is a fucking Navy SEAL here? Mm-hmm. What the fuck are you doing here? Right. Do you have some issues? Do you have war? Like, what is going on? Right. Are you lying to us about something? Did you, right? Rightfully so. Anyone would be suspicious. Great questions. Yeah. Great questions. But I was, I told them and I, I leaned in hard. I said, bro, I trashed my life. I fucked up my career two times. I had built it all back up, crushed it again. I really need to be here. I will be a great soldier for you. I'll do this. Just give me the opportunity to get in here and do this. And fucking they're like, all right, man. All right, let's do this. And yeah, man, they gave me a fake name, fake, fake whole deal. I had a French, French, uh, official passport on my first deployment with a fake name, fake European social security number, all that shit, man. You going out on the town over there? Or yeah. They keep you pretty locked up. No, that mean it's strict, right? Yeah. You get to the regiment. So it's kind of army, right? So it's, you guys would be familiar with like regiments and, and companies and mm-hmm. stuff. That's how the foreign legion is set up. So you get weekends off if you don't have gate duty, right? Because the French foreign legion outsources nothing. They do all their own security, their own medical, their own, you're working in the kitchen, all that shit. They do everything in-house. Mm. And so if you don't have gate duty, right, you're off on the weekends, right? If you're not at a training cycle, you're off on the weekends and it's still strict. You're checking in and out. You're going, you know, on a bus to a train and then you're there, but then you're left to your own devices and you have a fucking, a little a military card with a, with the fake name on it and your picture and that whole thing, dude. No issues with drinking while you were in the Legion? No, and like- no, because dude, I got in there and I was like, <sighs> Man, it wasn't wasn't perfect, right? Where the first time, because I still hadn't fixed the habits yet, mm-hmm. right? And I was, but I wasn't off partying. That's where shit changed, right? I wasn't off off just slamming shots in the bar. Mm. I was like, okay, let's let's start changing myself a little bit. I was locked down in the base a lot, and I had time to think. Started diving into philosophy. Started thinking back of when I was the most happy in my life. Oh, lo and behold, it was when I got up early. It was when I was on working out. It was when I was doing these disciplined things. Okay, I'm going to start doing it. But it wasn't perfect, right? I'd do it for a little while and then kind of fall off and then go on a training trip and then I'd come back and wasn't as disciplined. And I was, I would get up kind of early, but not all the time, you know? And But it was getting better. And it was like this like process that was coming. And then about... And I go on two deployments, right? While I'm there, I go to South America. We're doing uh, interdiction for gold mines and drugs and stuff, like deep jungle operations, which was legit. Hard, but legit. Came back and we did a NATO mission on like the Russian border with uh, on the Enhanced Forward Presence Battle Group with Estonia and and uh, the French, the Danish, and the English, in in uh, all in all together exercise. It wasn't you know crazy combat, just flexing on the border. Right of Russia. That's pretty much what it was. But a lot of tanks, man. I had never seen eighty six tanks in a line, like actually going on a, on an exercise. I was like, damn, bro. Right. That. So there were some cool things there that I got to experience. And then coming out of, but on that last deployment is when I really started to fucking lock it on. Mm. I was the only one up at like four, right, in the fucking cold in Estonia, like outside working on the outside, you know, those outside workout areas and stuff. And dude, I was starting to get this momentum. I started, I was like, okay. And then I was just like, dude, I'm not missing. And I came back and I was just like ratcheted it down even harder. And then this clarity started to come over me. 
where I started to feel better. I was like, what's, what am I doing differently? Well, I really started to feel good about myself. And that's what it was, Sean, is, is when I look back, I hadn't fixed my self-worth for all those years, right? I had been, needed that label, the seal, mm -hmm. the legionnaire, like, and I realized that when I became a seal, I still had this like kind of void. I don't know if it comes from childhood or like trauma, you know, I don't know, who knows, right? And I'm not writing that off as a, as a excuse for my bad behavior. I'm just saying, I think it there was a reason, you know, there was a, there was possibly a reason that I hadn't identified. And I go, oh dude, I just never always did the things I said I was going to do. All right. I said I was going to get up early and then maybe I wouldn't, but then my self-talk would suffer and I wouldn't even, I started to be more conscious, conscious of my own self-talk and my own things and more responsible and taking ownership for things. And my mood, right? Not being a fucking dick because I was in a bad mood and things like that. I just started to be more responsible about me and my and how I presented myself and my own energy and started realizing universal principles and things like that. And researching them and reading the bell and trying to figure out what the fuck, man. I needed to change whatever I was doing to unlearn some things so I stopped doing this shit. And what do you know? Fucking moving in. Now I'm like doing it every day. And I really started to feel better. And then I just, just was like, I'm not missing. This is just who I am. Mm -hmm. Get up early. I do these workouts, you know, not fucking perfect. Not putting you know, some peace under glass. It's just perfect. But man, I I'll, feel I'll, better today. Yeah, I'll never be. I'll never own that perfect spot. Like yeah. even, not even close. And I think it's just getting to the point where you accept that you're good enough. Yeah. And especially from where we've come from. Yeah. And one thing that you talked about that's really important is you read your way into a better mindset. Yeah. And I think if you if people out there listening to this don't read and you struggle, you're doing yourself such an injustice. You're missing a huge piece. It's a huge, I would say the yeah. biggest piece. Yeah, you're missing a huge piece. Is You have to read. Yes. There's there's nobody out there that succeeds in life that doesn't fucking read. Mm -hmm. Like in, in some... Uh, and I, I can't say nobody because obviously there's there's always outliers, right? Yeah. But the vast majority of us, we need that fucking knowledge from people that know better, than, from people that figure things out that we haven't. Yeah. And we need we need our brains to is to just constantly be chewing on the thought mm -hmm. and using our brains to think and to have deep thought. Yes. And so if you're not reading, please, you got to start. Like, and the old Stoic philosophers had it right. The old samurai philosophers had it right, right? I really like philosophy because you can take a lot from like one sentence, mm -hmm. which is, which, right? I'm not going to take five hours in the day to read War and no. Peace, right? Every day, right? But man, dude, take the time, quiet reflection, read some quotes and then how, and then apply them, right? Mm -hmm. That's the information's power, but information applied is real power. And in, in, innately, you'll want to apply it. You'll be motivated to apply it because it just makes fucking sense. You'll know what to apply, right? right? You'll right. have new information to, to, to change the way you think and act. Mm -hmm. And that was where I go, oh, I don't, you know, Marcus Aurelius, you know, you always have the, the option to have no opinion, right? Things, small little nuggets that I go, oh, I can just not give a shit about things that don't matter, right? Mm -hmm. it, how do I apply that to my life? And wow, mm -hmm. things like that are powerful and how a little bit of a, a one sentence can, and the old Zen proverb, let go or be dragged. Dude, when I read that, that was powerful for me because I had so many resentments and regrets and all these things. And I went, bro, it's dragging me. That, All that's dragging. Just hearing me. that after hearing your story, that's like a perfect, a perfect thing for you. Yeah. For, for what you've described to me in this last hour, let go or be dragged. I mean, it's beautiful. It's you, you can, you could let yourself be drugged into non-existence <sighs> from what you've experienced. Oh yeah. Or you could fucking let it go and yep. then start helping people, which is what you chose to do. Yeah, I dude, I had to, man, I had to because it was eating at me. These lessons learned. These lessons learned, I'm like, bro, you do not have to experience what that level of shame and regret and fucking, you do not have to fall from the pinnacles I fell. And I'm not saying, man, there's people that have experienced, you know, I'm not saying, but man, I have some lessons mm. and I promise you if, and this is kind of how I, when I, when guys come to me, I'm like, man, I'm, I go just live a little differently, 
apply some of these principles that helped me because the only reason that these uh, that I know these work is because I do them mm-hmm. and I you do them every day and it's and I had to find these bullet points these wickets I hit every day that make me feel better about who I am they make me better for people in my life they make me a better communicator sm- more intelligent right being taking time to read a little bit step out of myself don't don't be just getting input some some chick's ass on my phone right it's like dude all that stuff is just is that making you a better person politics right? politics dude it, you, people reaching for meaning with exterior things bro dude it's all inside of us mm. we can't fix shit or be good for shit until we're good that's it. And people are skipping that step. We see it all over. People protesting, people doing all this stuff, and their their lives are in shambles. Mm-hmm. Bro, that let's back it up. Let's get set. And I think men in general, we, man, people have families. People have responsibilities. And I get it, man. They're like, hey, I, I need to be getting. But, bro, you're not going to be good for any of those people if you're not good. If you come burning in and dying at fifth, die at fifty because of a heart attack because you're just not only the the physical and just taking care of your health, dude. The stress mm-hmm. of not being good, that subconscious voice that's like, you could be better, you could be better. Oh man, oh you you, you got a little too man, you're losing your wits about you, oh, yeah. bro. All that stress, quiet that voice because that's just higher consciousness telling you to live a line, man, telling you to slow the fuck down, simplify your life a little bit, man. Love yourself by not doing shit that you regret and makes you want to fucking hate yourself the next day. That was the piece that this disconnect, continuing to do these things that made me dislike what who I was. When I, and it's just, it's like lack of alignment, just not having integrity, right? One solid piece, an integral piece. You're not divided against yourself. You're not doing things that you fucking hate yourself for and then trying to... You're, you, that's true integrity is not doing that, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Living aligned and being one solid piece. Which is really fucking difficult. It's, and it's, right? Mm-hmm. And it's a constant battle. Constant. It's a constant fucking battle. I use this, this old adage of, man, you sweep the floor one day, it's clean, you got to sweep it again the next day. Or you have to sweep it every day. You're never going to arrive at alignment and alignment and this fucking, it's not a destination, Mm-hmm. It's a process that you're constantly striving for and enjoy that process and feel good about it when you're on that path, right? And that anxiety you feel and guys feel like, fuck, dude, I could be better and doing better. Man, anxiety is a state of punishment that you're not doing some things mm-hmm. or not making decisions you know you should make. And it's just taking the time to be honest about what those things are. And that's that's what I think actually an outside perspective outside entity is helpful with which is why i went into coaching and why i think it actually is, and i had to reach out and have someone do it for me because it helped me having that outside unbiased view go hey dude you're doing this stuff and it's kind of you're you're too you're in the forest you can't see the trees man it helps when someone's got got that bird's eye view and can help you identify where the friction points are mm-hmm. well i think this is a good place to wrap it up yeah it's been a great talking to you man and i think that your story is truly impactful and i think i think the biggest thing that the reason i do podcasts and have guys like you on is because of for not only because of your story and because i think guys like you are the people that need to be out there trying to help Mm -hmm. we're in this like internet phase right now of these fake gurus yeah and these fake people that are just trying to make a ton of money Mm -hmm. and manipulate people um you know, I forget like uh, Grant Cardone type people mm. that are just, in my opinion, are just liars and trying to manipulate people. Mm. Um, so the reality is we need people who have been through some shit, who've figured out the hard way habits that'll help them get out of that shit yeah. for those that are struggling and just want to live a peaceful, happy life and, yeah. and happy is subjective, but not bogged down with all the stress and anxiety of having, like you said, these conflicting personalities and these conflicting yep. habits that aren't allowing them to live peacefully within even themselves. Yeah. 
And if we can get some real people out there and if we could use our platform, this channel that we've cultivated as small in comparison to others as it is, if we could use it to get real people out there with a real message, yeah. then maybe we can quiet some of the bullshitters and maybe we can quiet some of the fucking nonsense that's yes. out on the internet mm-hmm. and get real people some actual fucking help. Yes. And the only test there is for that is not views. It's not any of that shit. It's are people being helped by this? Yes. Results. And results. Mm-hmm. Are they hearing the message, using the message, and then finding themselves in a better place today than they were yesterday? Absolutely. And that's all that fucking matters. Mm-hmm. Because we have an opportunity because of our stories. SEAL, yep. French Foreign Legion, Green Beret, for some reason, society's chosen to listen to us. Yep. And that comes with res- responsibility. Mm-hmm. And the responsibility that we have is to put our message out there for someone to get some fucking results from. Yes. And that's it. And if they do, then we succeed. And I think that they will based on your message. I so, appreciate that. Thanks, man. I appreciate you coming on. We'll see you at SHOT Show tomorrow. Yeah, I'll be out there, bro. All right, cool. Yeah, man. So, And uh, I really appreciate your guys' platform allowing me because, man, if you have lost your mojo, it's so easy to get back. I shouldn't say easy. It's simple. It's simple. It's hard because it requires change and it requires you to get honest. Get honest. Take that quiet reflection and start to take action, right? We develop a plan. We get a game plan. Man, you don't build a house without a blueprint. Get a blueprint for your life. It's the most important thing you build. So build it. Build it easy. Build it clean. Simple, I should say. And we start taking that action. Start taking those steps. Start chopping that wood every day. Start chopping that wood. And what do you know, man? Keep your head down. You look up. You've made a lot of progress oh, and you're yeah. feeling better. Your families are better. You're better, man. That's how we start fixing it. One man at a time yep. inside out. Absolutely. Right on. Well, thanks, man. It's been an honor to talk to you. I say that we do a round two at some point, Absolutely. especially because you're uh, a drive away. Yeah. So if you guys want to see round two of this and we dig even deeper into uh, the story and especially I have a ton of questions about the French foreign legion yep. that we didn't even get to um, lessons learned from that. I also, I could do a full podcast with you just talking about jail because I think there's a lot of people out there that have been to jail. Um, They feel ashamed of the fact that they've been to jail. They feel like they have a smear on their their history and their lineage that could be cleared up with lessons learned from that experience. Mm -hmm. Everything is a fucking experience and an opportunity to do something better. So um, I say we do this again. Uh, Let us know in the comments if you guys want to see that again. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Guys, give me a TCAF TV, TCAF official on Instagram, or taylorcavanaugh.com. There you go. See ya.